As we continue in our study of models of the solar system, it's time to talk historically about observations that were made to uh, you know, confirm or you know, disprove uh, various hypotheses. Um, confirm is probably too strong a word, but uh, to see if any hypotheses could be disproven. So that would be our, our goal for this video, to uh, discuss some of those observations. So it starts in the late 1500s with Tycho, Tycho Brahe being uh, an observer who essentially used very big protractors. It's not a telescope arrangement, but he had an observatory of sorts. He would measure the positions of the planets um, and kept very good records, and those became invaluable. Uh, we won't talk about it this lecture, but uh, upcoming lecture we'll see how uh, Kepler's assistant, or sorry, Tycho's assistant, Kepler, was able to use those observations to make some very important conclusions about the orbits of the planets. Uh, but observations are key here. This is really the uh, uh, the renaissance of science and observations becoming important rather than just thinking about something that was the uh, more the habit of the Greeks. Oh, so Galileo's telescope fits into this era. Um, Galileo did not invent the telescope, but he did use it to um, observe items in astronomy and record those observations and make very good uh, publications, uh, records. Uh, Galileo did build the telescope and his telescopes are on display in Florence. If you get the opportunity, you should go to the Science Museum there, filled with uh, a great deal of uh, old historical uh, astronomy instruments. One observation Galileo made was of the moon, and what he noticed was the moon was not smooth. There are high regions, there are low regions, you know, the craters, um, the moon's surface is definitely not smooth. It's not a perfect astronomical body. Galileo observed Jupiter, and he observed the positions of the four bright moons of Jupiter, and he came to the conclusion, the correct conclusion, that these moons were orbiting Jupiter. That's definitely not uh, geocentric. In the geocentric model, everything orbits the Earth. But here we have these four moons orbiting Jupiter. Most importantly, regarding the distinction between heliocentric and geocentric, would be Galileo's observations of the phases of Venus. So here we have the um, heliocentric model with uh, Venus going around the Sun, an observer on the Earth, and Venus goes through the phases that we've discussed with the Moon. Um, new, crescent, quarter, gibbous, full, you know, gibbous, a quarter and crescent again, and the uh, heliocentric model is the only model that can produce the prediction of the phases that are observed for Venus, that Galileo observed. Uh, the geocentric model, uh, the way that Venus moves um, is always such to keep Venus between the Earth and the Sun, at least approximately, and in that situation Venus can never get to the gibbous or the full phase, uh, but uh, Galileo did see Venus at the gibbous phase. That disproved the uh, geocentric model of the universe. Um, so Galileo's observations very important, and uh, the experiments that he did also very important. Uh, we'll just stick to our uh, astronomy uh, observations here. Um, so, Foucault pendulum, I mentioned before, evidence that the Earth rotates, um, and you can go to various museums. This one's in the Clark Museum in Salt Lake City. Um, and the um, Foucault pendulum is uh, set up to knock over dominoes or posts that are uh, around the edge here, and you have to wait a few minutes, but eventually it'll knock one over, and you'll see firsthand that the Earth rotates. Uh, so here we go with the metal bar. It's uh, being knocked over. And the pendulum swings in one plane. The Earth turns underneath it. The Earth is moving. 
uh, something that the geocentric model did not have, a moving Earth. Another evidence that the Earth moves would be stellar aberration. And in this effect, it was noticed that you have to point the telescope slightly away from a star in order to be able to have the light of the star go down the telescope tube. So the Earth is moving around the Sun. Light has a certain speed and we're not going to calculate the angle you have to uh, uh, shift by, but this aberration of starlight that the telescope has to be pointed not directly at the star but slightly away from it and it changes as the Earth moves around uh, the Sun, the direction you point the telescope. Uh, this was evidence that the Earth was moving. If the Earth was stationary, you could point the telescope right at the star and you'd see the star. But because this telescope is moving, the motion of the Earth carrying the telescope along, um, in order for the light to get down to the eyepiece, the telescope has to be angled slightly differently than directly towards the star. This is a great exaggeration. It's a small effect, but it was measurable. In uh, 1729, this aberration of starlight was, uh, was observed and understood. And then a little uh, demonstration of parallax. <clears throat> so we have Midland University here, the planetarium, the science building. And take note of where this pole is. This pole is uh, right at the edge of the, uh, the planetarium building. And now I, I moved, I think about three feet, uh, to the left. And that's all the motion I made. Now take a note of where this pole is. It's on the right edge of the planetarium building. So I'm going to go back one slide. Um, first position, I'm on the right edge of the sidewalk and we get the uh, near object being seen here against the more distant background and then I shift over about three feet to the left and now this near object is off to the right. This shift of position of this near object is the effect called parallax. So parallax, we see a shift in position of the nearby objects. Now in 1830, the parallax of a star was measured the stars are very far away and the shift back and forth as the Earth moves from one side of its orbit to another is small. But by 1830, uh, telescopes and uh, observing techniques were good enough that the parallax was observed. Again, uh, confirmation that the Earth is moving around the Sun. If the Earth was stationary, there would be no parallax, there would be no shifting of the nearby stars. And now many, many stars have had their parallax uh, values measured and this allows astronomers to calculate the distance to the stars. We're not going to go over that but uh, by telling you I moved three feet with the camera here and measuring the angle that this has shifted it would be possible to calculate the distance to this light pole, this nearby light pole. Another drawing here of the parallax situation regarding the Earth is the Earth goes around the Sun in, uh, at one time we look and we see that this near star is uh, alongside on the sky of a, a certain distant star. Six months later, the Earth is over here, the observer looks at this uh, nearby star and the observer measures it near a different star on the sky. This shift of position uh, is called parallax and Half of the total angle is called the parallax angle, and it's uh, used to calculate the distance to the stars that uh, we're not going to worry about. So there we have it. Uh, evidence came in that agrees with the heliocentric model of the solar system, that the sun is at the center, especially the phases of Venus are important, in that Venus goes into the gibbous phase. That requires Venus to go around the sun and uh, not being as, as it's placed in the geocentric model, which places Venus in between the Earth and the Sun um, and never at a configuration where Venus can be more distant than the Sun. Venus does get more distant than the Sun. The observations show it changes size, observations with a telescope. Um, so confirming the uh, heliocentric model, disproving the geocentric model. And the other observations of Galileo, again, you should review and uh, 
ask questions, 